I'm George Barna. I want to thank you for taking some time to be with me today. I want to talk with you about the whole issue of how people's lives are transformed by God. But let me start our conversation by asking you a question. If I asked you right now, turn off this recording, run out to your car, and drive to Kingston, New Jersey, would you do that? I mean, would you do that without knowing where Kingston, New Jersey is, having a map for that, having a good reason why to do it, and, you know, just really thinking through the whole process before you make that commitment? I sure hope not, because that wouldn't be awfully intelligent and responsible, would it? And yet, you know, the weird thing is, in a lot of ways, that's kind of what we ask people to do in our churches when it comes to the whole transformation process. We ask them to just get involved and go do something that we've given to them on the agenda. I mean, if you were to run out to your car right now and just jump in and start driving, chances are you'd get hopelessly lost. You'd become frustrated and irritated. You'd be wasting limited resources. You wouldn't reach the destination because chances are pretty good you don't know where Kingston, New Jersey is and how to get there from where you're sitting right now and eventually you just give up and change your plans altogether. See, and it's hard because that's what's happening with so many people in our churches is without knowing where's the ultimate destination. Why do I want to go there? How am I going to get there? They're dropping out. And so we've got to rethink the process. What I found in the research that I've been doing recently related to how do we disciple people? How are lives transformed? What can we do to help in that process? I've found things such as the fact that most of our people in our Christian churches in this country have no goals for spiritual development. In, in fact, most of them don't know where they're going spiritually, and all too few of them are making any kind of serious spiritual progress. I've found also that when we look at our churches and what we're doing in terms of trying to help them, most of our churches aren't really helping our parishioners, our congregants, to identify meaningful spiritual goals. And we're perhaps not giving them the kinds of tools and guidance that they need to really get to where they're going to go. See, what happens is they come to our churches and we want to be helpful. So what do we do? We give them a menu. It's a menu that has all kinds of options on it. A lot of different events and services and opportunities to serve and relationships and all these things and more. And frankly, most people see all the options on there and they're confused. And so they ask us, well, gee, which one should I take advantage of? And the typical response would be, it doesn't really matter. They're all good for you. In fact, not only doesn't it matter which one you choose, we'd like you to choose multiple options from that menu. Because the more of this that you digest, the better off you're going to be. And so our people go off and they keep digesting more information, more experiences, more information, more experiences, more relationships. But where is it leading to? You see, the, the question here is, what do they really need? Is it a map or a menu? We're giving them a menu, but I'd like to suggest that what they need is a map. They don't know the ultimate destination of this journey. Most of them have heard, perhaps you've taught, that yes, they're on a journey, a journey to wholeness, a journey to holiness, a journey through which God will transform them into a new person. But they don't really know what that means. And so they come in and they just take stuff off the menu without knowing where they're going. What I want to ask you to do is to rethink the kinds of tools and resources that you're providing to people. See, and, and toward doing that, I want to ask you some questions about the nature of your ministry. Uh, the first of those questions is very simple. What is the destination that we want to point them towards? I think that it's really a very simple answer. I know a lot of prophets and professors and preachers and prognosticators have tortured the scriptures to come up with convoluted answers. But where we want people to wind up is actually quite simple. We want them to be Christ-like. We want them to be whole. We want them to be holy because God is holy. We want them to be transformed. And so our job 
is to support them and to empower them in that process of becoming that kind of person. You know, when we turn to the scriptures, we find that Paul wrote quite a bit about this whole process. In Romans 12, too, you'll remember, he wrote, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. And he followed that thought up in Galatians 6.15, where he wrote, you know, what counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. You see, but based on the research that I've been doing, I know that there's a lot of confusion among both individuals and church leaders as to what that means. The question that many ask is, okay, we're supposed to be transformed, but transformed into what? A new person, yes, but what kind of new person? I mean, are we talking about moving from being unchurched to churched, from guilty sinner to forgiven disciple, from passive attender to active churchman, from freeloader to tither? I mean, what is the nature of that transition that we're being asked to make? What is this new person or this new creation that's talked about in the pages of Scripture? I think the scriptures continue to give us a lot of good insight into the nature of that transformation. If we were to turn, for instance, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul wrote, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. We could look at Mark in chapter 12, verses 30 and 31, where Jesus himself gave us a very good, very succinct understanding of what transformation is about when he said, you must love the Lord your God with all your mind, strength, heart, and soul. And and the second commandment is equally as important, love your neighbor as yourself. There he was giving us a good understanding of where this destination ultimately winds up. In in fact, we could look at additional scriptures. Perhaps we look at, at Galatians 5. The passage on the fruit of the Spirit where Paul in verses 22 and 23 talks about what is that fruit. You see, and he says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, helping us understand what does this transformation look like in very practical, tangible terms. And John 18 underscores Uh, excuse me, John 15, verse 8, underscores just how critically important that fruit is. When Jesus himself said, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to God the Father. And so one way of summarizing this journey, the ultimate destination, in fact, the purpose of transformation, is for us to understand that it's all about living for Christ about giving him control of everything in our lives so that we intimately and intensely love God and love other people. We bless God. We bless other people with everything that we can, everything that we've got in our lives. And and we demonstrate that kind of depth of love, that intensity of love, by pursuing only his will in our life and by trying to integrate our understanding of that will and the pursuit of it into every fiber of our being. See, transformation is something that enables us to gradually die to sin, self, and society so that we gain that freedom that Christ offers us. We take on that new identity that we have through this transformation process by what uh, Jesus has done for us. What we know is that Transformation really is about becoming a a holy individual, not because we're good or perfect, but because we've submitted ourselves to God. We've surrendered to Him. We're pursuing His will. We've, We've relied solely upon the blood of Christ that enables the Holy Spirit now to take over our lives and empower us to become a new creation. You see, but all of this raises more questions. Questions like, well, Are Christians, in fact, living the transformed life? And while I don't want to discourage anyone, and I don't mean to say anything negative about what churches are doing toward helping people to become transformed individuals, we need to be realistic about what's actually happening. That's where the research comes into play, to paint a portrait 
of what we see within the church. So for instance, as we look at some statistics among adults who consider themselves to be Christian and attend Christian churches, we can look, for instance, at some of their beliefs and commitments. And what we discover is that we're probably not where we want to be in that realm. Look at some of these numbers. We know that only about 10% of these people are individuals who live with the biblical worldview. We know that only one out of seven of them say that living for God and their relationship with God is the highest priority in their life. Only one out of six of them believe that there is such a thing as absolute moral and spiritual truth and that it's conveyed to us in the scriptures. We know that only one out of four of them believe that they are holy people, not meaning that they're perfect, but that they're set aside by God through the blood of Christ. We know that only about one out of three of them would say that success depends in any part on their obedience to God. And we realize as well that four out of ten of these individuals who call themselves Christians, who consistently come to our churches, believe that Jesus sinned. Six out of ten of them believe that there's no such thing as the Holy Spirit. Six out of ten of them say there is no such thing as the devil. We can look even beyond this. We can look at some of the behaviors of these Christians. And what we see is that only one out of every 17 of them, just 6%, tithe in the past year. We know that only 11% of them will have a conversation during the course of the typical week with someone they encounter who has different spiritual beliefs than they do. We know that less than one out of five of them will fast during the course of a three-month period of time for religious or spiritual purposes. We know that only one out of five of them say that the most important decision they ever made was asking Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins and to save them from the consequences of those sins. We realize from the research that only one out of every five of them say it's imperative if you want to grow spiritually to be part of a community of spiritual individuals. We realize that less than uh, one out of every four individuals believe that they are completely dependent upon God in their life today. We realize that only one-third of them has made any kind of a verbal confession to another Christian about struggles in their life, sins in their life at any time during the past three months. And when it comes to other matters of faith, we've also discovered from the research that less than one out of five say they're totally investing themselves in their spiritual development, i.e. their transformation process. Less than one out of four say that the most important relationship in their life is their relationship with God or with Jesus. And we know that relatively few, barely one out of four, believe that God is always on their mind or part of their consciousness.